And look, what do you see right here? This looks like it could be salt or something right here. Look at this mineral. Look at this. What do you think this is, guys? Salt? Huh? Do you think this is salt meal? Yeah, that's salt. Hold it. It's filming. So I gotta taste it. So I'm gonna, I'll take the first lick. Take this lick. Salt. It is salt. We just found salt here in Gaial. This is a salt marsh. So this is Mara. This is bitter water. Shalom and greetings to my brothers and sisters in Messiah Yeshua who have his testimony and guard his commandments. Brother Nick here and today is the 24th day of the fifth month on Yahweh Elohim's Enoch solar calendar, the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, the calendar of Jubilees in the book of Enoch and also found in the Torah and the Prophets. Brother Nick here and again today it's August 12th, 2022. In this video right now, I'm recording from the Dead Sea area of Shatim, Jordan. I'm here on the Dead Sea, and this video is about the Vanderlaan's search for the real Mount Sinai and Exodus Trail in northwest Saudi Arabia. About one month ago from publishing this video, my family and I finished a three-week excursion and exploration in northwest Saudi Arabia for the Exodus route and the real Mount Sinai. From June 24th through July 16th, 2022, my family sojourned in the Tabuk Governorate and Naom, Saudi Arabia to verify for ourselves the internet claims of the real Mount Sinai being Jebel Makla and or Jebel El Luz and also the Red Sea Crossing site and other of other sites and locations of the Exodus route, as claimed by Ron Wyatt and many other people. In this video, I'm going to present you my findings, and I will also challenge some of the claims of Ron Wyatt and his wife disseminated on the internet that has been perpetuated regarding the sites of the real Mount Sinai. And this video isn't necessarily conclusive, but I will be presenting some challenges to the information that's already out there published on the internet regarding the claims by Ron Wyatt, but I'll also be pro providing new information regarding some possible sites regarding the Exodus 17 battle site, uh, regarding Yahweh Nisi, the altar of Yahweh that Moses built uh, after the battle over the, and win over the Malachites, the hill that Moses sat on and raised up his hands with the Malachites, with the stone that he was sat on, as well as also the possible location of the bitter waters of Mara, which will change the whole idea of the Exodus route. So here is a picture of me and my four sons viewing Jabal Makla, which some people claim to be the real Mount Sinai. Jabal al is very close. Jabal al might be this peak right here, but this is the false peak of Jabal Makla, and then this is the real peak of Jabal Makla behind it. And here are all the Vanderlaans, me and my wife and our six children, here at in front of Jabal Makla. Here we are sitting at the base of Jebel Makla on carved stones that are falsely identified as the 12 stones of Moses by the Wyatts. So you see these white stones. These are pretty famous for people who know about Mount Sinai being in northwest Arabia. These stones are chiseled stones. They're chiseled marble stones, pieces of a column. These are not the 12 standing stones of Moses. And to pass that on, it's a fallacy. This is false. Okay, these are not the 12, Moses' stones were standing stones, not chiseled stones, and not pieces of a column. So this right here is false. So the 12 standing stones of Moses, this is an example of a real Israelite standing stone. This standing stone is found under the city of David in Jerusalem. And this is a metal box that they built around the standing stone here. This is an actual standing stone. So this is what a biblical Israelite standing stone looks like. Possibly a standing stone of Melchizedek. Who knows? 
or standing stone of the tabernacle of David, who knows. When I first arrived in Jerusalem in no, at the end of November 2017, at the beginning of uh, December 2017, I was blessed to be taken down on a private viewing of this stone, complimentary of the city of David. So hallelujah, and I'm thankful for that tour. And I saw this stone for myself with my own eyes, and at the same time, I've seen these chiseled stones at the base of Mount Sinai. The, the, the chiseled stones at the base of Mount Sinai is not an Israelite standing stone. This is completely different than those 12 chiseled marble pillars. This stone is not cut with hands. It's just a rough, rugged stone that has been put upright and not what I was sitting on in those pictures, not a marbled chiseled column. Those are not the 12 stones of Moses. That is a lie. That's an internet fallacy. That's incorrect and wrong. And to perpetuate that, to get people to the site is false and it should not be allowed. It needs to be checked and called what it is a lie, not biblical evidence of the 12 standing stones. And so we are also right here sitting next to what's called the altar site. They call these like animal shoots or something and then they said behind us the altar but this is false because this is not an altar this is not an altar where the all animals were offered up there's no altar present at this site what you're looking at is a picture of archaeologist scott stripling and scott stripling suggests that joshua's altar on mount ebel was in a circular shape approximately two meters wide and three levels of stone high so what you're looking at here is an exact replica of the circular altar found on mount ebel that some associate to be with joshua and if you notice there is no circular altar like this two meters in diameter found at the base of jebel makla rather there is a site that some people identify as a Nabataean marble quarry and workshop at the bottom of Jebel Makla. At the base of Jebel Makla, the site of the chiseled stones that my wife right here is sitting on, and then here's this animal shoot that they call it an animal shoot, but might be a Nabataean workshop. There is no altar of two meters in diameter present. Obviously, Joshua, he would have got understood how to build an altar from Moses, and it would have been two meters diameter like this, three layers of stone high. There's nothing there present. Um, but I did actually identify an odd dirt mound with stones inside of it here that my children are standing on. Our guide, June, who had been to the mountain base many times previous on tours, had never seen the dirt mound before I pointed it out to him. So this was something new for him, considering he had been there many times before. Here's another angle of that dirt mound that my children and stones mixed in that my children are playing on. And notice that it is in circular shape. And here's a close-up with my children in the background and with June here. And some of the stones in this dirt pile are upright. And there are some very large stones that were here that you can see uh, in here. This dirt pile does not seem indigenous to the base of the mountain area. Notice that everywhere here on all the other places, it's rocks on top of the soil. Here, this is all soil exposed but there's no hole from where this soil came from, which is kind of odd because in this wash are huge rocks and huge boulders. Here's small rocks. There's no place around where it's just dirt and there's no hole in this area where they dug the dirt from and built a pile of dirt here. So this dirt looks like it was moved here because it doesn't look like it came from this area, this mountain site area, which is kind of strange that there's just a pile of dirt with big rocks in the dirt as well.
which is kind of odd because here's a big rock here and here's another rock here and there were some big rocks towards the top of the dirt pile. But rather this dirt appears to either have been brought in possibly to bury something underneath all of these stones. We don't know for sure. One possibility and the first possibility is it could be a dump pile from the 2002 Albid excavation of this area, of this site. It was excavated by archaeologist Abdul Rahman Ansari, who excavated this area, the base of uh, Jebel Makla, being a marble stone quarry and workshop. So what all of this dirt in these rocks piles can be right here, it could be leftovers from a previous dig of Abdul Ram Rahman Ansari when he dug and excavated this workshop right here, possibly being an Abitian stone quarry. Or my second guess is that it could be a mound by the Israelites to cover up the circular altar of Moses, to cover up Moses' circular altar and the 12 standing stones. So I doubt it. This, this is a question on what is this site. It could be a dump site from a previous dig, a pile of the leftover stuff that they got and they just left it there, or it could have been something could be underneath here like a circular altar of Moses and 12 standing stones into the ground that have been covered over by the Israelites when they left this site, if this site be the real Mount Sinai. So I don't know what to say if this site is the site of the uh, the site of Mount Sinai. I can't say for certain that Jabal Makla is this site. One of the problems that I have with Jabal Makla being the site is this proposed golden calf altar. Um, and it's proposed that the Israelites drew these pictures of the all of these calf, these cow hieroglyphs on it. My question is why would Moses permit uh, these images to be stayed up here and the idolatry of these images to stay in the camp while they were here at uh, Jabal uh, Makla or at this Sinai site for another seven, eight, nine months until they left. That makes no sense at all for that these images to be there. It doesn't make any sense. Moses would have destroyed these images just as he destroyed the golden calf. So that right there is suspect to me after seeing that and also it's important to note that the Wyatts they falsely claimed that these cows these images are Egyptian when they are not that these 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 images of cattle like this appear in other places in northwest Saudi Arabia and it's Arabian artwork to the Arabian Peninsula not Egyptian so the claim by Ron Wyatt that these were drawn by the Israelites or the Wyatt family, it's false. It's a false claim. So here's a picture of myself and my guide, June. June was a guide who turned into a driver. He first brought us to the mountain, but then after I got to the mountain and I saw, start, started seeing things that I didn't find things that I was looking for and started questioning things that I saw like these rocks here. These aren't 12 standing stones. Then June turned into a driver and we started exploring northwest Saudi Arabia, visiting several sites that he had not been before and finding things that he had not yet seen before, just like that pile of dirt and stones that are mixed in. So it turned out to be more of an expedition to find new findings of the Exodus route that I'm now going to share with you here. So the Vanderlaans at the Split Rock, here we are at Horeb, and it's an impressive standing stone when you get to see it in person. And, and very important to note that it is a standing stone, and that's important possibly to Yahweh. Standing stones are very important to the Israelites. So it, that's what it does have going for it. It is a standing stone. It's extremely tall. It's extremely impressive. The split down the middle, it's, it's very impressive. But there are there is at least one internet fallacy about the rock, and that is the fact that there is no water erosion on the rock. 
all of the erosion in all of this area is wind erosion, not water erosion. And wind erosion can be seen everywhere, all around the rocks that are underneath it and everywhere else in northwest Saudi Arabia, in this area, in these canyons, in these wadis, wind erosion. So that's an internet fallacy that there is water erosion coming down here. Remember, the Israelites were not at this camp that long, and more than likely the water did stop. They might have only pitched in Rephidim just a few days uh, before they had to come to the other side of the mountain when the commandments were given. So the water had to have stopped at some point, and there would not be a long time, not, and certainly not a long enough time to cause water erosion on these rocks at some point. And also, there are a lot of split rocks all over northwest Saudi Arabia. Once you start driving around looking for split rocks, large split rocks, they are everywhere, can be seen everywhere. And even in the wadi behind this one, there, which is a little bit closer to the Jibba al Luz mountain range, there is another large split rock. But again, at the same time, this rock that you see right here very well could be the rock that Moses struck. But that depends if this place be Horeb. But this place might not be Horeb, and that's up for debate. But I do want to point out that if the water did pour down this rock over here to the left side of the photo, there is an area where the water could have went downhill and into a channel and poured out and made pools of water in the desert as per the psalmist said. So now let me show you that where that is. So here's the split rock of Horeb. This is actually marked in the correct location. Right here, this red dot at the end of this big canyon, right here, this big wadi, there is a large, another large standing rock. Not like that one, it's just a big rock, not a rock on top of a rock. So this rock is very impressive, the split rock of what they call Horeb. So now let me zoom in on this area here and show you how the water could have pooled up into pools of water in the wilderness as per the psalm says. So here's the split rock of Horeb. And if the water flowed out from this rock, it would have flown down this way with gravity and it would have gotten into a channel. And there's a channel here that goes in between this this little wadi right here and comes out and would fill this area up here this area in the red here the water would have flown down the rock started filling up this area in red here once this area in red overflowed with water it would have gone here and it would have gone downhill here and started filling up this area and once this area got filled up it would do the same thing and it would go on to a third pool right here so this rock could fill up a pool of water, a pool of water, a pool of water, and then the overflow could have came out from here. So it could have created pools of water in the wilderness in this location, if that be the split rock of Horeb. If this be Horeb, and if this be, if Luz or Jebel Makla be the real Mount Sinai. By the split rock of Horeb, there is a square altar by the split rock that the Codwells discovered. But this altar is in a square shape. As you can see, there's a 90 degree angle here and it is in square shape. And I measured the bottom right cornerstone with a compass. And interesting is that this square altar, it is aligned to the cardinal points of north, south, east, and west. So here's my cell phone. That, here's one of the cell phones that we had with a compass at the base. And when you read it, when you read the uh, compass, it is aligned due north. And this is a 90 degree angle right here. The stone is placed at 90 degrees, which means, which means that this, this side is facing due east. This side of the altar over here is facing due west. This side is facing north and south. So it's completely aligned with the cardinal points and that this altar is at the base of the split rock. So this altar would be like right, right here where the word Horeb is. If this is the split rock, it's in this area right here. So if this is the rock in Horeb, 
that would mean that this area is Rephidim in here. And now I want to share with you a possible location of the Exodus 17 battle site of the Israelites versus the Amalekites that I possibly located and discovered on this trip. So here I am possibly sitting on Moses' seat. That stone right there possibly is Moses' seat. And this also possibly might be the altar that Moses built or the area of the altar that Moses built of Yahweh Nisi, which means Yahweh is my banner, which means that I'm actually sitting where the Exodus 17 battle took place. Now, this is all contingent, depending if the rock of the Caldwells is actually the rock of Horeb, which is contingent being that Jabal Makla or Jabal Al-Luz is the real Mount Sinai, then this would be the hill uh, that uh, uh, the battlefield, I'll show you the battlefield of Exodus 17, and also the hill that Moses sat was on, and the stone that I'm sitting on would be the stone that Moses, that uh, uh, her and Aaron pulled up for Moses to sit on. And again, this is contingent if also this is Rephidim. And this is brand new information. This is a new find that I found. If I found it and it's correct, hallelujah, I have no idea to verify that this is the site, but this is the best possible location for the Exodus 17 battlefield. And I'm going to show it to you right now. So here is the split rock of Horeb right here. This would be Jebel uh, Luz, Jebel Makla is down here. This area could be what's called the Camp of Rephidim. Here's where one of the pools of water would have been. Here's another pool of water, and here's a, a third pool of water possibly from the overflowing of the split rock. And now I'm going to show you where the Exodus 17 battlefield is. Right here is the Exodus 17 battlefield, what I propose to possibly be it. And that little circle with that little dark speck in there is the hill that Moses sat on over the looking over the Exodus 17 battlefield. This is a downward slope from the top right here where this hill is. The hill's on the top of a slope, and that slope is a downward slope. You're looking at a picture of the hill, but you're looking upward over only a part, a segment of the battlefield. P approximately 25% of the battlefield area is in front of you, and behind me is about 75% of, of the space of the battle battlefield is if we were to turn around and look down the slope. And it's important to note that the lower part of this hill is hidden behind the upward part of the slope. So there, this is this ground is sloping upward. So this is the hill that you're looking at, and it's the lower part of that little hill is hidden behind the upward slope and also possibly the wide angle lens of the camera. So here is the slope, and you are looking uphill at that little hill right here, but that little hill has a tremendous uh, vantage point. And here I am at the top of the hill, looking down at the battlefield and you can see you can see all the way at the bottom of the slope from the top of the hill so from this little speck right here you can see this entire area which is a very large area very very large area you can see the entire area from the top of this little hill right here you can see all the way down to the bottom here and even part way over here and right here is what I propose to be the battlefield with the sun setting behind the mountains. And just the timing of that photo brought this verse into mind of Exodus 17, verse 12. But the hands of Moses were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there on. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun and what's interesting is is that from this vantage point you can also see the going down of the sun at this time that I took this photo right here and you would have complete view of the entire battlefield 
where jo Joshua and the Malachites probably had their battle. And on top of the hill is a large stone that is perfect to sit on and view the possible battlefield below. Now, this is not the battlefield. This would have been an area of the camp of the Israelites. I'm facing, right now I'm facing east, but the battlefield was west or northwest here of the stone in the opposite direction. And here, here I am sitting on it with my two, with two of my four sons. My, one of my other sons taking the picture. I'm six foot nine, six feet nine inches tall, and this stone is likely a perfect height for someone around six foot or shorter. And there are a bunch of stones on the top of the hill. And my question is, are these stones possibly the remnant of the altar of Yahweh Nisi? Yahweh is my banner. So that's a question regarding this site. And now some video footage of the proposed Exodus 17 battlefield. So here in the back, you got Jabal Al-Laz, you got Jabal Makla, this is Horeb, you got the stone somewhere beyond those mountains over here on the ground. This is Rephidim, more than likely. And here I am on top of this hill. And I've been with June all day searching Rephidim we went to the rock and here we are the sun's going down and we wanted to find Yahweh Nisi and it was it was Moses it said that he was on the top of the hill and they had to bring him a rock to sit on and not only did he need a rock to sit on after the battle he built a altar we've been looking at altars all day false altars, actually possibly Nabataean altar sites in the area. And right here, as you can see, June, what's your opinion of this circular area right here, June, that's filled in? Possibly? Yeah. Possibly this is Yahwanisi. Right here at the top. Now, you can see everywhere. And this is exactly if the, if the Israelites were encamped in Rephidim back here, Moses told Joshua to come out to meet the Amalekites to go battle with them. And it was until sundown. So you can see the sun going down. And this is the perfect area to actually have one of those ancient type battles. Yeah. Where you can, and as Moses would have been up here, he could have seen everything going on as the sun set. So he also said that Aaron... And uh, her, I think it was, they took a rock up here for Moses to sit on. And right here, I want to show you this interesting rock up here. Here's this rock at the top. Where this altar is up here, this flat altered area possibly. Right here, this rock. So you have this rock right here, and, and also you can, well that's a fire pit, someone made a fire pit up here. But he could have easily... So here... So Moses could have easily been sitting right here on this rock that they brought up for him. He could have sat up here with his hands up, held up here for the battle. So now that we've explored Rephidim, we've explored Exodus 17, the possible site of Moses' altar, Yahweh Nisi, the possible stone that Moses sat on, Moses' seat, and the hill that he sat on as he watched the Exodus 17 battlefield. Now let me go ahead and explore the possible southern Exodus Red Sea crossing route. And the Exodus Trail. So here is the possible Exodus route with the Southern Red Sea crossing site. I've always, ever since I've looked on Google Earth, Google Maps, I've seen the Straits of Tehran, and I've always saw how shallow the water looked. It looked like there was a natural land bridge there. So I always thought that this was an alternate site to Ron Wyatt's site that he proposed up at Nueva Beach. And... There is other information on the internet about this southern crossing site. 
Other people have also pr proposed this trail. And what I want to share with you, a couple of things here regarding the Red Sea Crossing site. I'm going to take you through this possible route, plus the most viable possibility that has been presented on the internet for the site of Mara, right here, the bitter waters of Mara. And I'm going to share that with you as well. Another alternate site for Elim and the 70 palm trees, the site for the Red Sea camp. And then lastly, Mount Jebel Harb or Jebel Horeb or the area of Horeb over here in the east, possibly being the real Mount Sinai. So let's go ahead and begin. First off, I want to share about the Red Sea crossing site that this location of the Red Sea crossing site, there, there is no physical evidence of a true land bridge from Nueva Beach to, to Saudi Arabia. But there is a real land bridge here in the Red Sea crossing that is very doable as the majority of this water here is only 50 meters deep, which is totally plausible for the Israelites to pass through. Also, there's a very important verse in the scriptures regarding that after Moses closed his, closed his hands on the Egyptians and the sea came down on the Egyptians, it said the waters returned to their normal flow. Exodus 14, 27 from the Hebraic Roots Bible. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its usual flow at the turning of the morning, and the Egyptians were fleeing to meet it. What do you mean by that, the waters turned to their normal flow? That's, that's really strange when you think of it between Nueva and Saudi Arabia. It could be talking about the currents, but the biggest current area would be right here in the Strait of Tehran, of water coming in during the tide and water coming out during the tide right here. This verse that I, I identify uh, fits the best location of here in the Straits of Tehran of the waters flowing in and out of this channel right here in, during the tides. So that is something to consider. Uh, that verse of the of the Israelites, the water going in and out of the Straits of Tehran. That makes no sense. That verse makes no sense at Nueva, but it makes total sense here that as the tide got higher here in the uh, Gulf of Aqaba, that the water would flow in, and then when the tides go down, that it would flow out. So that makes total sense that that, that verse in Exodus, that might be the key verse to identifying the Red Sea crossing site. So now, this is Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, on the Sinai Peninsula, and this is Ras al-Sheikh Hamid in Saudi Arabia, and this would be the, the Red Sea crossing site. And this is the picture that I took of the Tehran Straits, the southern proposed crossing site of the Red Sea, and you are looking west to Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, right here at the end of the peninsula, the Sinai Peninsula, and like I said, there is a real land bridge under this water. It's very shallow here, and you can see the colors of the different colors of the water. It was absolutely a beautiful late afternoon when we took pictures here and had a meal here. It was fantastic. They could have been tangled up in those mountains. Here is a graphic that is compiled on Bible.ca, and this is not an endorsement of the doctrine of the guy who runs this website. Here's a graphic of what the underwater land bridge of the Strait of Tehran looks like. It's 250 meters to 300 meters deep right here at the first part, and then it's 50 meters across, 50 meters deep across through the rest of it, while Nueva is 875 meters deep. And there's definitely not a land bridge, as Ron Wyatt says. Sure, you go to the north, it gets really deep, and you go to the south, it's really deep. But still, this is not a land bridge. It's extremely deep. And here they are, Tehran versus Nueva right here. Tehran is definitely a, 
uh, easier way to cross, easier way to disperse all of that water by an east wind. So Tehran is more than likely. And over the ages, we don't know how much of this depth right here has been carved out due to the natural ebb and flow of the tides flowing in and out of the channel right here through the Tehran Strait. So this 250 to 300 meters deep section, what is now 250 to 300 meters deep, could have been the result of 3,500 years of ebb and flow of the tides and of the currents in this section, carving out this area over the last 3,500 years. It says after they crossed the Red Sea, they went out three days into the wilderness searching for water. And this area I propose, as well as others, is the wilderness uh, uh, that they uh, sojourned looking for water. And if you looked for water, you would have came to Gaal. So you can spend several days here looking for water. They would have came to Gaal, this area of Gaal right here, and they, which is I presenting is biblical Mara. And here is the area of Kial or Gayal or Kial. And this area right here that you can see outlined with the yellow is a place where water builds up. So I decided to take a look at this site as this site seemed like a possible location to me. And then when I found across another website on the internet, they also proposed this site as well as being biblical Mara, but they didn't have any information on it. So I went down there to investigate it myself to take a look at what we can find. And what's interesting about that water, it builds up here. The water would flow from the mountains here, flow down the mountains here and flow all the way down through El Bad into this plain underneath the ground, sometimes on top of the ground, sometimes underneath the ground. And then it would exit out here Right out here, it would, the water would flow through from big storms, flash flooding in the deserts and all of that, and it would flow out here. So water would flow through that area right here as it's exiting into the Red Sea or into this gulf right here. So when we went out to Kial, it turned out to actually be a salt marsh, which is absolutely amazing because there's nothing on the internet. There's no information on the internet or on that other website that I found about Kial, Saudi Arabia being a salt marsh. Could this be the biblical site of Mara, the bitter waters? Again, here's some footage that I came stumbling. We don't know, but this is me and my family here at that site. There's a little water right here. And here is what the dried salt marsh looks like. This is all dried salt and mud mixed together during the summertime period. But this place would fill up with water during the wet months after and after flash flooding. Here's some video footage of us possibly finding biblical Mara. And as you can see, this is all mud. This is footage of me stepping out here on this flat for the first time and that's not just mud it's crusty dried mud and it's actually salt crystals that are dried with mud and making salt crystal formations and look at how this mud is built up here this would have been all runoff and look what do you see right here this looks like it could be salt or something right here look at this mineral look at this what do you think this is guys salt Oh, huh? do you think this is salt now? Yeah, Hold it, it's filming. So I gotta taste it. So I'm gonna, I'll take the first lick. Take the first lick. Salt. It is salt. We just found salt here in Gaial. This is a salt marsh. So this is Mara. This is bitter water. So this water would have filled in all the way from the runoffs over here. This area is at the end of a big flat but sloping plain as it reaches to the sea and in the winter and springtime rains that would have flowed off and would have settled in this area and this area obviously would dried off this was in july so it was hot when we filmed this and all the water from the spring and the winter rains would have already evaporated by then and what else do you say 
and look at this is where the water would collect water it would run off of these wadis and it would collect right here especially if the israelites came in the springtime they would have had all the winter rains come through here water buildup could have been here don't touch it that's water so go down there and pull it up it's all water it's all muddy water right here what did you find naomi Oh, Naomi found water here. Look at the water here in Gayal, or Biblical Mara, possibly. That is that is salt water. Oh yeah, there's stuff in there. Yeah, but it's salt. It's salt water. Wow. So. I wanted to pause the video and draw your attention to all of this salt that you can see, literally built up. That you could see how this salt formed here after the waters dried up. It crystallized on top, and some of it mixed mixed with mud, and other parts did, doesn't have as much mud in it, and it's more of a white salt. And as you can see, this is all salt. And what do we find? We find some salt water here in Gayal. And now on the screen is our driver and our guide to the area, June. This is his first time visiting this area. I specifically wanted to check this area out because I just was not content with the northern, with the crossing from Nueva. And also this is my wife, Jackie, coming out here for the first time onto the crunchy, dried, white salt marsh. This is biblical, this is a salt. No, no, look, this is naturally like that. This, look, this is a salt marsh. Hey, look, look at the water right there. Yeah, look how yeah, deep that goes. Right. Yeah, of course. Jesus, it's going really deep. Pull. Wow, look at how deep that is. Pull that up, Joe. Oh, wow, it's all salt water. No, you don't have to. We know you can. Guys, this is Biblical Mara. The Israelites probably passed south through the Straits of Tehran. Tehran. It does smell like sulfur. What do you have to say about this site? About the rain and the water? Yeah, the rain is high water right here. Bitter waters. The, the bitter waters of Mara. Now, after Biblical Mara, right here, they left to Elim, and there is Wadi Ain Una. And Wadi Ain Una is the valley, Wadi, of Ain Springs Una. I don't know what Una means, but Ain is Springs of Una. So we went out here to take a look at this area to see what this area looked like. Here's a, a, a shot that I took of a bunch of uh, palm trees, doom palm trees. Uh, some of them are dead in this wadi. Here's one that's alive, and here's an up close footage of it. So one, it said that there were 70 uh, palms and 12 springs of water. This is one palm tree, and this one palm tree has like, I don't know, like 30 heads that are branched off. And these all have doom palms that are dropped down here that you can eat. So these sugar palms that you can eat with all of the, the water that's all by it. And here's some video footage of us exploring Wadi Ain Una. Wadi Ain Una. Ain Ain means spring. So these are springs here. Not just wells, but there's a, there's, there were used to be springs. These palms are, yeah. These are indigenous palms here. Why is dirty? Why can't you do that? So each cluster of palm trees counts as one palm. Yeah, that's how you would have counted. Like, see that grouping right there? There's like seven or eight coming out, but that's one palm. Like, cluster of possum. Yeah, these are the doom homes right here. Yeah, that's a doom home. 
so they have like a nut. And after Wadi Ain Una, or Eileen, it said that they came back to and camped at the Red Sea. And that site possibly is modern day Sharma. And there's the beach here at modern day Sharma as well. And here is some pictures and footage that I have of us being in the, checking out the Red Sea. So here's the sunset at Sharma Beach. And here's a picture of us before sunset looking east and as you can see the mountain the spectacular mountain range and there's a bunch of doom palms here and there's a there's some vegetation all in this area and now here's a little bit of video footage that i have of the possible red sea camp at sharma okay so we're here at the bay in sharma which is now naom bay the new city here in Saudi Arabia and some people believe that it's a possibility that this is the location where the Israelites camped at the Red Sea we see this fence here this is going to be um, fenced off for archaeological purposes and you can see all of the doom palm trees they are the same doom palm trees that you saw up in possibly site of Elim Ain Ayuna The sign says it's an archaeological area and it could be from a later period. The Nabataean port area, this would have been a Nabataean port area, but that happened later, thousand years after the Israelites came through here, or 1200 years later after the Israelites, or even more than that. So this area here very well could have been when the Israelites camped by the Red Sea, they camped in this area with all of these palm trees. So this is Neom Bay or Sharma Bay. This would be the area of the Red Sea camp. They, they said they camped by the sea again. Some people possibly believe this is the Red Sea camp over here. Down this way would be Jabal Harb and you can see Jabal Harb. This mountain right here behind those palm trees is Jabal Harb. Modern day Jebel Harb. Possibly Horeb on the ancient map. That's how you pronounce it. So at least like uh, 30 miles that way is Horeb. And lastly, after the Israelites camped at the Red Sea, they went to two locations on their way to Horeb. And so some people have them coming up here north, which is a very large incline up, a steep incline up. 
but an, a, a natural exit route of a very low grade incline that is extremely doable to walk out and journey out by foot would be through this way here on your exit route out to Horeb. Because the mountains above El Bad, it gets extremely steep going up to Jebel El Luz, huge rocks in the wadi, it's very treacherous. While this route right here, it's all doable on, and this right here, this is almost impossible or impassable. It's really bad in through this area right here. But this coming up this way, uh, we went back through here through in a pickup truck. 4x4 four four pickup truck, and it is very reasonable. Uh, it's, it's level, it's cleared out, and the grade is easy. While there's some really, really steep, treacherous parts in here, up here in this area, and up, up here as well. But this area to what they call Mount Horeb, or Jebel Harb, it's, it's completely doable. Would possibly be through this wilderness here, which leads into what could be Rephidim and into Horeb, possibly. Can't say for certain that this is Horeb, but it possibly is, because there is a mountain called Jebel Harb. And Jebel Harb, you have the HRB, which it would be the same thing as Mount Horeb, HRB, Hey Resh Bet, would be right here. So Jebel Harb. And Jebel Harb is right here, and in this range would be Jebel Harb. And even though we did three weeks here, I wanted to do more, but it was just time for us to go. We went to Jebel Harb and explored this area here, but we were not able, I was not able to explore the six kilometers or eight kilometers of mountain front here. Um, we were able to explore this canyon here and come back into the canyon behind it. But here's a picture that I took of Jebel Harb. And could this be Mount Sinai? Can't say that it is for certain. And that's where I'm going to leave this video very inconclusively regarding the location of the real Mount Sinai. I have some lo I have some ideas some other possibilities looking for alternate sites of the real Mount Sinai as I'm inconclusive on the physical evidence found at Jebel Makla and Jebel Al Luz. It could be, but they also might not be. The reason why, if you think about the reason why we all say, oh, it's Jebel Al Luz or Jebel Makla, Ron Wyatt, he saw the highest mountain in the mountain range and he said, let's go here. He went there. They found the Golden Calf Altar Site, which we, everybody says is the Golden Calf Altar Site. He said these are Egyptian drawings, which they're not. They're Arabian drawings. Also, he said these are the 12 stones. Those are not the 12 stones. This is the altar. It's not an altar. There's a lot of... Uh, the, the, the physical evidence just isn't there. Just because he picked this mountain because it was the tallest and found this stuff doesn't make a lot of sense. But there is possibly... It could possibly be... But it might not possibly be. The one thing else that that mountain has going for it is, is that it can be easily walked up by an 80-year-old Moses can go on a hike and make it up that mountain. Sure, he could. Moses was in great health. An 80-year-old can do that hike. Okay. Um, it is climbable. This one is not necessarily climbable. So I I personally, I'm not uh, certain that Jebel Makla or Jebel Aluz is Mount Sinai. There's a couple of other locations. First of all, that crossing route is not the crossing route. Let's be honest, if someone found Pharaoh's gold chariot wheel, Ron Y, if he really found that gold chariot wheel, he would have brought it up to the surface and he would have given it to the Antiquities Authority. He wouldn't let a piece of a gold chariot wheel of Pharaoh sit in the Red Sea to be lost forever. They would have totally recovered that, okay? So there's there's just a lot of suspect stuff about what Ron Wyatt claims. Let's just be honest about it. To come across Pharaoh's gold chariot wheel and then just leave it there at the bottom of the Red Sea for someone else to take. Come on, let's be real. He would have taken, they would have recovered that and given it to the 
Antiquities Authority. At the time, Sinai Peninsula was under the control of Israel. No problem. He could have totally brought it up and give it there. That makes no sense. So with that being said, highly suspect of Ron Wyatt's claims. Definitely. Um, the Copper Scroll, I hope, is going to expose Ron Wyatt as a liar that he found the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem because the Copper Scroll gives the indication that it's here at Qumran, right across the Dead Sea from me here. I hope that comes to light and that Noah's, all of that, all that stuff comes to light and maybe he did not find the real Mount Sinai. Also, when I read the text of Exodus 14, Exodus 15, it, it, it looks to me that Pharaoh did not go into the sea. It looks like Pharaoh's army went in the sea, Pharaoh's chariots went into the sea, but Pharaoh himself and his chariot did not go into the sea, possibly. That's how I'm reading the text. So if that is the case, if I am correct regarding the text, this video is already as long as it is, maybe I can do that in another video, but it doesn't even look like Pharaoh even went after the Israelites, that Pharaoh stayed on the shore and did not go in with his horsemen, his chariots, and his men but rather let them go in, and he witnessed their destruction. So that is something also to consider, that that golden wheel of Pharaoh that is allegedly found at Nueva Beach somewhere that was left at the bottom and never brought up, that that golden chariot wheel that belonged to Pharaoh because it was four spokes wasn't even Pharaoh's because Pharaoh didn't even go in according to the text. If you read the text carefully, and like I said, there's no true land bridge from Nueva to Saudi. The land bridge is here in Sharm el Sheikh. The waters return to their natural flow or their regular flow. And that would have been the inflow and outflow of the Gulf of Aqaba, not some small current here up here at Nueva. And also, it looks like the Israelites possibly cross, cross south. There has yet to be uh, a, a, another uh, possibility for biblical Mara. Elim would be here, the Red Sea uh, camp would be here, and over in this range could possibly be Horeb, or they could have came here and that mountain could somewhere be right here on this side of the mountain range and all the way up through here. Even up here before Wadi Rum, at the south of Wadi Rum, there is a possible site to be explored. It's not conclusive to me that Jebel Makla is the real Mount Sinai or Jebel Alus is the real Mount Sinai. It could be, but I'm not certain. I'm not certain that it is or isn't. I'm I'm really indifferent about it right now until it can be conclusively found. But there's some lo interesting location, uh, interesting mountain location here on the southern border of, uh, of Jordan that I've yet to check out. There's a couple of other locations here that need to be checked out as well uh, along this area. And it just needs more in depth. So I, I, I think that, hey, if you're an explorer, you know, rather than coming here to the site, you can come here and check out the site like I did. To me, every, the internet claims were inconclusive and actually proved to some of them were fallacies. But I would suggest coming here to check out this location. And I'm signing off. So looking forward to the comments and putting it out there that the new possible locations and I'm signing off and shalom to my brothers and sisters in Messiah Yeshua who have his testimony and guard his commandments. Shalom to you.